So in any case, in the name of the scientific committee I would like to, and the local organizers, I would like to thank you all for being here today and uh, to accept, have accepted to participate. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, Peter Crampton. I'm not going to introduce Peter Crampton <laughs> as usual, you know, as those things go, you know, he doesn't need any introduction. He's from the University of Cologne, half-time uh, University of Mailand. Um, He's going to talk about renewable energy and electricity market design. You all know his work, uh, you know, in areas like auction, for example, and market design, uh, um, where he's done uh, pioneering work. But I still remember little P Peter Crampton when he was a student at Stanford working on bargaining. And, you know, he has done lots of things, not only auction theory and, and market design, but he, you know, when he was young, for example, he was working on bargaining, he was working on dissolving partnerships, he was working on things like that, which was also fascinating. So he has a, I'm not going to go through his CV because I think it's much more interesting to listen to him. And Peter, for your keynote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here today. Uh, and I am going to talk about electricity market design and especially focusing on the, whether the electricity market design that we have today, at least the best designs, are robust to large shares of renewable energy and if not, what needs to be done as these markets uh, evolve, as they will. Uh, as you all know, the electricity landscaping is in a transition. Uh, it will transition, I'm sure. The only question is how long it will take. Uh, but we already see it. Some countries are much more, uh, much farther along than, than others. Um, but the whole world is moving towards large shares of renewables, and the market design needs to uh, work well in that environment. So when talking about market design, let's see, I always start with what's the goal of the market? And in electricity, the goal is straightforward. Reliability, um, reliable electricity at least cost. And I split it into two forms of efficiency, short run efficiency, uh, making the best use of the existing resources, and long run efficiency, getting the right mix and uh, quantity of resources. And both are very important. I'm going to focus uh, first on short run efficiency and then on the more difficult task of long run efficiency. But the reason I do that is that uh, short run efficiency is a, a necessary condition for uh, long run efficiency. If the, 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 the first, that is the place to start. Um, without uh, short run efficiency sending the right price signals in the spot markets, one can't have uh, long run efficiency. So electricity is a very interesting environment to work in. It's also a very challenging environment to work in. Uh, we have to balance supply and demand at every instant. We have literally thousands of uh, transmission and resource constraints that have to be uh, managed. And we have shocks in supply. Um, the uh, transmission lines can fail. The generators can fail. Uh, we have an increasing share of renewables, which uh, the sun might not shine, the wind might not blow. Um, and we have to accommodate all those things. We also have to recognize, uh, at least in, historically, the demand side has not been responsive. Uh, the demand side is generally not seen or felt uh, the uh, spot price. And so we've treated demand as uh, completely inelastic. And all of the adjustments have been done on the supply side. In the new world, and we're already moving well along in that, uh, we're, we're going to have a uh, much more robust demand side. Uh, so we'll have demand response. We already have it with industrial consumers, uh, and we have it with some uh, retail consumers. But we're going to have to get the demand side much more involved in order to have pro uh, proper price formation and efficient markets going forward. And so once we move to more of a two-sided market, 
things will work uh, uh, much better and make it a lot easier to withstand a very high share of intermittent renewables. <clears throat> The final wrinkle that we're having to deal with is climate policy. Uh, climate policy has been less than optimal in, I think, every country in the world. And certainly globally, it's been a disaster. Um, and this has made the long run investment opportunities uh, problematic uh, in the electricity sector. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that later on, but certainly, and, and I'll talk more about climate policy. Uh, at the end. <clears throat> so what is a successful market design? And I'm going to be a little bit uh, US focused here and, and perhaps US biased in favor of uh, the, the market design we've evolved to uh, there. And in fact, I will, my, as my lead example will be the Texas market, ERCOT, um, because I'm very familiar with it, I, I serve as an independent director on the board of er ERCOT, um, and because it's going through a lot of uh, adaptation that is quite relevant for the rest of the world. So, as I said, the foundation of the electricity market is the spot market. You have to get the, uh, the right prices and the right resources uh, generating. Um, in real time, but this is supported by, uh, in the US, by a day ahead market for scheduling and unit commitment, uh, followed by uh, bid based security strain, constrained economic dispatch. And that foundation uh, then provides a, a good landscape for uh, extensive forward trading which is essential for managing risk and improving the performance of the uh, electricity market. So let me go into a bit more detail. The day ahead market is, as I said, we uh, schedule uh, um, all the resources, make the unit commitments, and determine the um, uh, prices on a day ahead basis. The day ahead market is uh, purely financial. Um, so the resources can, can do different things in the real-time market and, and often do, um, but the day ahead market sets the right incentives for people to perform in real-time um, largely consistent with what happens in the day ahead. But of course stuff happens and the real-time provides the opportunity for all the adjustments, which is really great. Uh, the market uh, includes uh, the possibility of three-part bids where uh, resources can express their, uh, their startup costs, their minimum energy costs, and then their, their marginal costs, their, their uh, energy offer curve. And we'd allow, um, as in all, pretty much all the markets, uh, virtual offers and bids, which are very important for arbitraging between day ahead and real time. Uh, so that's proved to be uh, uh, quite important. The objective is to uh, maximize social welfare subject to uh, all the constraints. Um, we co-optimize energy and reserves in the day ahead market. And then in the best markets, this is also done in real time. Texas is actually just introducing real time co-optimization of energy and reserves. Um, so the market's re-optimized um, throughout the day. And the, uh, what's, what's produced is uh, uh, competitive equilibrium prices, um, the uh, locational marginal prices that represent the marginal contribution of uh, each resource at each location at every time. The, Handling of the non-convexities is important for certain types of units. You know, certainly it's not important for uh, the renewables, but it's important for the combined cycle and the um, certain other gas units and certainly coal units. And, and it's not so important for nuclear because you, you know, you, you've made your decision long ago about whether you're going to be on. Um, but it, 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 it it is handled well. One of the nice things about uh, allowing the three-part bids is 
then the resource can offer its true economics if it's, say, combined cycle or, or coal plant. And um, that's helpful in uh, automatic market mitigation in the event that there's, uh, there isn't competition because of uh, transmission constraints, for example. The, and, and then it's, you know, that information is needed in order to optimally schedule the resources in any event to the extent that they, they, they're, they're bidding consistent with the, their true economics. Um, it's pro-competitive uh, in that uh, a small generator with just a few resources would have difficulty uh, optimally scheduling those resources. They wouldn't have the information. A large uh, dominant incumbent has a, a, a large enough fleet that they probably can do pretty well ske scheduling on their own. Um, but the small guy actually needs the system operator with much better information to optimally schedule the resource. And then it also creates a, um, an ability to hedge um, the real-time price volatility for the small guy, which is very important. In, in Texas, the day ahead market is voluntary, so not everybody participates in it. Uh, and about a, a bit over half of the market does. Um, the system operator still needs to know what the plans are in order to um, manage the system, and so all the resources submit their plans and can adjust those plans uh, throughout the day up to one hour um, before the beginning of the day. And, um, the system operator might find that they have to, uh, uh, on, on actually rare occasions, have to commit some additional resources for reliability. And so that uh, is done very close to the last minute. And when that is done, so as not to interfere with the market, um, that those resources are offered at a very high uh, floor price of $1,500. Uh, I've already mentioned um, the, the need for reserves to handle flexibility, and these reserves are, in, in, in Texas, are two forms of regulation, up and down, and, and then responsive reserves that are online and the non-spin reserves that are offline. Um, these, the quantities that are needed, uh, change from time to time as the uh, system changes and the resources change. And this is some, an area where when you introduce lots of renewables, you're going to need more changes because you need more flexibility. And in fact, in the extreme, you may need to introduce new products. Uh, for example, you know, right now there's a large surplus of inertia. Uh, so inertia isn't something that would, is uh, uh, valued uh, today. But if we had an enormous amount of uh, uh, renewables that did not have inertia, then uh, inertia might be an ancillary sort of, uh, service that needs to be introduced. In terms of cost, these reserves are actually a very important part of the economics of certain units that have these capabilities. So it's very important that the pricing for the reserves reflects their marginal contribution to the system. In terms of overall cost to the consumer, uh, it's actually fairly small. So, so for the resource providing these reserves, the, the reserves are priced at uh, you know, no, no fuels involved, and they're priced around $10, so that's significant. But for the consumer, the reserves are, um, maybe the, in, in this last year they were $1.60, um, so it's a fairly sm uh, modest cost for uh, having these reserves which are essential to, to keep the lights on. The real-time market, as I said, security constrained economic dispatch. Um, so we, we, it's run uh, determining prices uh, on a five minute basis. And now we're both financial and physical. But one of the wonderful things of uh, the electricity market done in this way is we have uh, this great device for uh, settling forward positions in a uh, perfectly efficient way. There is lots of liquidity in both the day ahead and the real time market. Um, yeah, everything goes through the real time market. The day ahead market is, uh, as I said, it's between 50 and 60 percent of the uh, energy is bid through the, the day ahead market. So it certainly has 
even when it's voluntary, it has, uh, uh, plays a very big role. And we do get the price convergence between day ahead and real time that, uh, of course, you would expect. Um, day ahead prices might be slightly higher because of uh, loads. Um, uh, desire in um, reducing real-time risk. When looking at market performance, it's always good to look at uh, the system under a bit of stress. And in Texas, that stress comes in the summertime. Uh, it's very hot. There's lots of air conditioning. Um, the, and so this is actually the summer of 2017. Uh, the load is the gray at the top. And I display the day ahead price in orange and the real time price in blue. Um, and you can see the real time price much more volatile. Um, and one of the th things that's uh, interesting is uh, right over here where the load drops off at the end of August. So what's going on there? Well, it turns out that's Hurricane Harvey. And you see there's a blip in the day ahead price. Um, and that's because a very bad thing happened. This nasty hurricane arrived and uh, created a, some real risk that there would be serious disruption in the electricity market. And there was a fair amount of disruption. But nonetheless, the market uh, worked out uh, just fine. You can see the real-time prices never uh, spiked. And in fact, the wholesale market worked perfectly throughout this event, which was an extreme event. Uh, Texas received 52 inches of rain over a five-day period, uh, over a, a, a meter and a half of rain, um, incredible winds, uh, 42,000 lightning strikes, uh, transmission lines down, as you can see, there's lots of distribution that was down, and um, uh, substations under several meters of water. Um, so, so this was a big event. But throughout this event, uh, the wholesale market just kept chugging along, um, doing what it does, uh, setting the prices, establishing the prices based on the bids in order to operate the system and keep as many lights on as possible. Now, certainly many people did lose electricity. But as you saw from that drop in load, it wasn't everybody. It was, it was just some. And, and then they were brought back online. Um, uh, fairly quickly. So, so that's a, uh, you know, I view as a, a good outcome. One element that, that I think is very important in the Texas market, and I believe should be an element of all markets, uh, until there's robust uh, demand participation, is shortage pricing. Um, so the shortage pricing is an administrative construct. Um, which recognizes that reserves have significant value in times of shortages. That's what uh, will keep the lights on. So it's this ability to avoid load shedding that uh, is valued. And the marginal value of reserves then is going to depend on the value of lost load and the probability of lost load. And of course, the probability of lost load, as you uh, start to uh, run out of reserves, uh, approaches one and you start shedding load. And that is what we use in, in, in Texas as the, the, the means to send the right price signal during times of extreme scarcity. Um, the way I think of it is it's the uh, system operator or the regulator's uh, representation of the consumer's preference for reliability. Because uh, right now, consumers can't express their preference for reliability. Eventually, we'll have robust demand side bidding uh, which, and uh, participation. And uh, there will be no possibility of shortage, because the consumers will simply say that, you know, at this price, I don't, I don't want as much. But we're not there yet. So this is what the curve looks like. And the value of lost load in Texas uh, for many, many years has been $9,000. So it's a big number, but perhaps maybe not high enough. Um, but it kicks in uh, at higher reserve levels, um, begins to kick in uh, because of the, uh, a increasingly significant probability of lost load. <clears throat> Now, in most of the recent years, actually, this uh, 
operating reserve demand curve hasn't played a very big role in terms of the economics. It has played a big role behind the scenes because it's that possibility of those very high prices that has motivated a lot of forward contracting. So that's been a very positive thing. Um, you know, so people, so having that, it, it's, it's basically this extremely useful device that when it's working perfectly, it's actually rarely uh, utilized. But when the market gets tighter, when the reserve margin falls, as it, as it did in 2018, it starts to become significant. So here's the revenues coming from the operating reserve demand curve in green there. Um, and it's going to be significant in 2019. You'll see our reserve margins are even lower. Um, so the, the importance of these forward contracting, it's, it's, you know, really is essential to uh, have the market work well, um, especially in times of stress. The California energy crisis in 2000, you'll recall, was uh, largely caused by the absence of forward contracting on the part of the utilities, uh, which had them go bankrupt then uh, very quickly when there was uh, a period of scarcity because of a, a, a lack of water and uh, heat in California. And so the market failed when one side of the market can't pay their bills. Um, forward contracting avoids that, uh, reduces risk. The, the generators have the, the generating, the, their generators and the fuel contracts uh, to provide a physical hedge. And then uh, for the consumers, it provides a hedge against the uh, high prices during, during real time. And as I said, the shortage pricing really does motivate extensive forward contracting, which we see uh, a great deal in all the well-functioning markets, uh, Texas uh, included. <clears throat> and the forward contracting also greatly improves, improves the bidding incentives, uh, which is very nice. So the exercise of market power becomes le much less of a problem when uh, parties are in balanced positions. They have no incentive to uh, exercise market power. Uh, this indicates actually a, a lower bound of the amount of forward contracting uh, uh, hedging by load um, from the real-time price. It's just based on the, the er uh, contracts that are run through ERCOT. And you can see that uh, only about 10% in those summer months is unhedged uh, for load. So very, very small quantity unhedged. And it's probably much less than that, uh, given bi bilaterals that they hold. The forward contracting also provides a very good price signal, which motivates uh, good uh, incentives for uh, uh, behavior. So if we look at right before last spring, uh, before the 2018 summer, um, you can see in green here the, uh, the August uh, forward, peak forward, uh, going very high. And what that does is it basically gives people the expectation that prices may be very high in uh, August, and so the folks plan ahead. And so what they're doing here, so these are outages, planned outages um, in orange and green, where they're getting their resources all tuned up so that they're going to be available in these summer months. And this is exactly what we have, uh, what we had happen, and there were no problems last summer, despite the fact that there was a very low reserve margin, uh, under 10%. Uh, last summer, which was the lowest it's ever been um, until this year. And the, this is the load that's available, th this is, I'm sorry, the resources available to serve load. This is the, the unavailable wind. And so you can see how spiky, once you add, this is, and, and uh, at this time we have 19% wind. So you can see how spiky uh, load is in, um, in a world with even 19% re uh, renewables. And you increase that by a factor of four and it's gonna look uh, much more spiky. And you're gonna need a lot of other resources that are gonna step in. So let me turn to investment. Uh, that was a broad brush of the um, uh, spot market and which supports the forward contracting. And then the forward contracting supports uh, long run investment. 
Um, well, if we look at the Texas market over the last many years and look at the energy, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the net revenues that a combustion turbine uh, would get from the market, you can see compared to the estimated cost of new entry, which is about uh, $90, um, the, uh, there was just one year, 2011, where the, um, the market would support uh, entry by a new combustion turbine. And this was an unusual event. 2011 was the worst summer in history. Uh, so 150 years of data collection, there was no summer like this. And in fact, the winter was really bad too. So it was a nightmare year for electricity. And um, uh, through this period, there's actually a very high reserve margin. And so no, uh, it's not surprising, this is sort of the market working that the uh, energy price is low and, and they're, they're not making a return. And now things are starting to move upward, but they've got a way to go if we want to have entry from uh, combustion turbines. There isn't actually uh, many combustion turbines being built in uh, Texas, except at particular locations where they might be especially valuable because of our locational pricing. Um, so. Here's the net revenues for a combined cycle unit. And you get a similar picture. They're making more money, yes, but they're also more expensive to build. Um, more like $110. And, um, so the, and they're also losing money. And if we look then at other locations, other uh, technologies, solar and wind, everything's pretty much the same. Um, certainly, if you're building a, a gas unit in the West, you know, combined cycle actually is doing really well in the West um, in this last year, and that's because the, the West, the gas price is incredibly low. In fact, this spring, we went multiple weeks with a negative gas price. So that's really, you know, heaven, running your, com your combined cycle with a negative gas price. Um, and, but, but still, it's, it's uh, you know, extremely low in the West because of the, uh, the, the difficulties in transporting all the, the, uh, the gas that's derived as a, a byproduct from in the fracking for uh, oil. So it's, when, when more uh, transmission is built, uh, gas pipelines are built, then that will, uh, that'll, that'll turn around. Um, solar and wind, their economics seems to be uh, similar, um, and, but their costs are coming down, as I will uh, show, and, and as you know. And so this is the, the situation in Texas now and looking forward. Um, what we have is a reserve margin in this year, 7.4%, which is historically low. It's never been this low, and we will see how we do uh, this summer. Fortunately, the weather this summer does not look to be like 2011. It's going to be uh, a much more temperate summer uh, in all likelihood. So there's some chance that uh, um, we'll avoid too many emergency events, but that certainly is a, a possibility. In terms of what's being built, it's basically the same in the future years. It's the same as what we've had for the last several years. Uh, wind and solar is being built, and a little bit of gas. And that's what's been happening in Texas for the last many years. We haven't built coal in uh, a long, long time. And in fact, it's um, uh, coal retirements that we're seeing, and quite a bit of them. So last year, over five gigawatts of coal retired. Uh, that's about 8% of the system. And this year we're having more large coal retirements. So the solar and wind is replacing uh, the uh, coal units, uh, and that's a great thing. Um, it is, and it's happening fairly quickly, but still, uh, as you'll see, it's, uh, it's taking a while. 
Now, one thing the Texas market doesn't have is a capacity market. The East Coast markets in the US, because of the, the bad economics of entry, they, they also have a similar picture to uh, Texas. Um, they're not getting the investment. Texas is getting uh, pretty robust investment. Uh, and it's really the departure of these large coal units that's leading to the low reserve margin. But on the East Coast, where the investment incentives, uh, investment challenges are perhaps greater, um, they found it necessary to introduce a capacity market to maintain adequate resources. And it's took, taken them a long time to get the capacity market right. Uh, and perhaps they, uh, and, and I think that they've moved fairly close. I think the big challenge for, for long run investment actually in the US is this chaotic, uh, climate policy, which is really messing things up. Um, but the elements of a good capacity market that we see in these East Coast markets are that first it's conducted many years in advance so that new entry can compete. Um, the product is defined as the ability to deliver energy during shortage. Uh, there's very strong performance incentives. Your, your, your selling capacity uh, leads to a financial obligation to provide energy during shortage hours. And that provides a nice hedge for load, and it also provides nice motivation for the uh, generators to be there that are offering capacity. Um, so the early markets got all of those things wrong, but the current markets uh, have them right. And the benefit of the capacity market is this coordinated uh, investment to ensure adequate resources. <clears throat> when we look across the markets in the United States, um, you can see er ERCOT's there on the, the left, the, 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 ones, the East Coast markets with capacity markets, it's 2017 and 2018, are on the right, and you can see the capacity market is a significant uh, portion of the economics. You can also see that uh, in all the markets, uh, we're actually uh, still below the um, the, the cost of uh, 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 a turbine, except potentially in uh, New England. Um, so now let me focus on the transformation to renewables. And this actually, uh, the, the, the next picture I'll show is one that uh, Paul Joskow showed four years ago in 2015 in this very room. And it looked very much like this, you know, except we hadn't had this uptick here. So, so he presented a fairly gloomy picture. He gave the world an F on its uh, accomplishments in climate policy and, um, and said, explained how we had to, uh, you know, turn the corner and start moving down substantially, and that remains true. So the world is doing a terrible job overall. Um, we're, this is the world, this is not the US or, or Texas, this is the world. And it's, um, um, something's gotta change. Um, but we are making, you know, at this stage, I think we can, um, there is some cause for hope, but uh, it's not gonna be uh, easy. One of the causes for hope is the substantial reduction in cost of uh, renewables, especially uh, solar photovoltaic uh, drops, has dropped enormously, and onshore wind has dropped enormously. The, now, if this would keep going, that this would be amazing, uh, but it won't keep going. Uh, these are fairly mature technologies and that have been developed a great deal, and so we can have very modest improvements, but unless we shift to some radical new technology, it's very unlikely that they're going to be able to have the kind of price uh, reductions or cost reductions that we've seen over the last 10 years as we uh, flew down the learning curve for uh, wind and photovoltaic. So, you know, those are the, the technologies of now, and they are uh, relatively inexpensive, and they are being built. Uh, so in the U.S., this is the picture uh, for 2019. Uh, you can see in yellow, we're building a lot of uh, solar in places where the sun shines, which is actually very nice. 
and we're building a lot of wind where the wind blows and we've got uh, some gas, almost all of it, uh, very nice combined cycle units uh, being built as well. Uh, and that's replacing the uh, retiring coal and um, some retiring nuclear. And there's some old gas plants too, but it's mostly uh, the coal and the nuclear that's, uh, that's vanishing. So this, and another piece of good news is the capability of these new, new resources that are building, being built. The solar and wind are both improving in terms of capacity factors. The gas is, uh, the, the, the new combined cycle units are incredibly efficient and incredibly flexible. They start more quickly, they can ramp, so, so we're building units now, uh, 1,200 megawatt uh, plant uh, that can ramp 100 megawatts a minute. So that's pretty good. In, in 10 minutes, it can go up a gigawatt. Uh, and that's the kind of flexibility that's going to be enormously valuable in this future world with a very large share of renewables. So th throughout the US, despite the fact that we have no, I mean, what's our climate policy in the US? Trump is subsidizing coal. He's doing everything he can to make dirty, ugly coal big again. He uses some other words. I can't remember what they are. Uh, but uh, it's, you know, that's our policy. And what's happening in Texas? Texas is not the environmental state of uh, the union. It is, in fact, but what's it doing? It's a leader in wind, and eventually California is the leader in solar, but um, uh, solar is being introduced in a big way in California. So despite our uh, climate policy, um, the economics are driving everything. And the economics are exactly what you see uh, here. This is all driven by economics. There, you know, granted, there's some, still some remaining subsidies for uh, wind and solar, but it's basically uh, the, the economics of these resources, which are now uh, very nice. And so that's good. The challenge is these resources um, are intermittent, so there's a lot more uncertainty. There's, uh, if we think of wind and solar, uh, they have zero marginal cost, and so um, you have to be a little concerned about price formation if you're going to rely heavily on the supply side for the price formation. Now, in fact, the supply side will help with price formation. Uh, in particular, the uh, storage units will be bidding opportunity cost. Uh, of their limited storage capability, and uh, so, so that's going to help, and of course the, the gas units also um, will uh, have, have a significant uh, marginal cost that will le uh, contribute to price formation. But we're going to have to have the demand side involved in price formation down the road, uh, certainly when we get up to 80% uh, renewables, um, absolutely. <clears throat> This is some good news about wind. In, uh, this is back to Texas. And you can see all the wind that's come in and the capacity factors this year, of the, or the past year, 2018, of the um, uh, wind resources. And you can see their capacity factors going up, up, up. Um, this coastal wind actually is especially interesting because the coastal wind is most valuable to the system. The wind tends to blow on the coast during the summer peak, uh, and so that's very nice. And so that's displayed here. So this is uh, the summer peak, a, a day in the summer peak, and so we, we experience the peak here in these hours. And so you can see that um, the coastal wind in, in red here is just ideal. It follows the, the, uh, the, the peak uh, nearly perfectly. And solar is tremendously valuable, too. So Texas is actually uh, very well suited to accommodate a large share of renewables. Plus the fact, another feature of renewables like wind and solar, is they require a lot of real estate. And uh, Texas has a lot of real estate. 
uh, so cheap real estate, uh, lots of land, and uh, that helps a great deal too. So, so a place like Texas is really, you know, should be leading the, the charge. Um, if these, and, and of course, if there was a, a carbon price, uh, then uh, this transition would happen uh, much, much faster. But you can see that the rest of the wind, outside of this coastal in red, the west of the wind, wind is uh, negatively correlated with the peak. And so it's, uh, it's not doing so well, but it does have a high capacity factor, uh, a higher capacity factor than it used to. So that, that's good. In terms of the energy mix, overall, you see 19% is coming from wind now, and that's going up. Uh, coal, you know, we've been dropping uh, coal plants uh, right and left. Uh, coal is still producing 25%. And this is sort of the, the problem if we look at the next 20 years. These plants have lives of 20 to 30 years or more, and it's hard, without a significant carbon price, it's hard to drive them off the, the, the system. So coal is dying in the US, and especially in Texas with a low gas price, but if you're in a place where the gas price isn't so low, then, like Germany, then you need something more to push coal uh, away, and that would be a, a, a carbon price. <clears throat> uh, the other thing you notice is, you know, the, it, things don't change uh, very quickly. Even though all we've been doing is introducing wind and solar, solar doesn't even appear on the, the I mean, it's in this other category, it's less than 1%. Um, and uh, wind has come up enormously, but it's still, it's gonna take a while for us to get to 80% renewables. <clears throat> so, what are we gonna need? Um, my view is actually the core design uh, works still quite well and that given that we're not going to jump to 80% renewables, we're actually going to have some time to make uh, uh, the, the improvements needed to make the market design work. And what we need is uh, we need to have a lot more flexibility and to reward that flexibility based on its contribution. So that's the task. And the best markets actually do a pretty good job of that. Um, but we're going to have to get the demand side more involved with, uh, for example, uh, smart homes. And we're going to have to have more storage. Uh, in the US, the economic storage is uh, lithium ion batteries today. Um, hopefully someday storage will be uh, uh, less expensive. Um, but, uh, and, and I'm sure it will be. That's still, that's, lithium ion is fairly mature, but uh, we can still expect some modest price reductions. Uh, there. Um, whatever we do, it's going to be done better if it's done with efficient price signals. Uh, price is an incredibly powerful instrument which will to, to affect uh, investors' decision making, which is what this is all about, and consumers' uh, choices as well. So we need to send efficient price signals. Um, we are going to have more and more locational issues, so the, the benefits of nodal pricing are going to be stronger than ever. Uh, as soon as you have this intermittency, uh, it can happen in you know, fairly strange ways, and that's why I can say with certainty that there's going to be more benefits from nodal pricing. Nodal pricing works, uh, it works quite well, and someday, perhaps even in my lifetime, Europe will have nodal pricing. Uh, it probably is a 30-year project, um, so it's unclear whether I'll be around, but uh, uh, we'll see. I can be optimistic. Um, my view is that pretending there's no congestion just doesn't work, that uh, Germany is a very good example of that. There's one German price, and um, uh, no matter what, and what that has led to, given the large introduction of wind in the north and load in the south, and insufficient transmission is redispatch costs of 1.5 billion euros last year. That's a lot of money, that's serious money. I remember many years ago when Texas was debating nodal, they had a, 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 a zonal system and they said that, well, 
when the redispatch cost gets up to 25 million, then we'll switch to know-it-all. Um, so, you know, this is dramatically higher than that. Texas is about the same size as Germany uh, electrically, uh, although much smaller in population. Shortage pricing is going to be increasingly important as well. That's what's going to give the storage units the reward that they need and other units that can bring that flexibility. That's what's going to motivate that uh, 100 megawatt ramping rate of the um, uh, combined cycle plants. So very important. Um, just an example on to get the demand side involved, um, one thing you can do, so some markets have, um, in fact most markets, pretty much all markets where they have retail competition will have a default contract for those that don't decide on a provider. And one can make the default contract, that right now the default contract is a fixed rate. You pay the same fixed rate regardless of what the spot price is. An alternative, which would be far superior, is one which exposes the consumer to the spot price on the margin. That doesn't mean we have to expose them to the spot price, uh, it, uh, it expose them to enormous risk from the spot price because the system operator can buy forward on their behalf their expected consumption. And so we can actually have a, a device like this that, uh, that, that, that lets the consumer uh, see and feel the spot price, or at least the consumer's devices and algorithms, and that uh, can be a very positive force. Of course, the consumer can opt out of it and get the, the, the flat rate if that's what they want, but this would be a big step uh, forward. And, but it is a big step. Uh, in Texas, we do actually have a retail contract that is the spot price. Uh, which is uh, you know k kind of neat. I don't know what percentage uh, select that, um, but it, it's perfectly reasonable for consumers to pay prices. And of course, we're going to have to get the uh, locational pricing uh, on the demand side as well. Um, so even in our nodal markets, the demand side, there's still lots of aggregation. And with distributed energy resources and the like, we're going to have to do uh, more of that. Now. Coming back to climate policy and the challenges for long-run investment, uh, our climate policy in the U.S. and throughout the world really is characterized as incoherent and unstable, I think, and we, we need to do better. Um, if you're thinking about building a power plant anywhere, a first order concern for you, you're looking at the revenues that the resource is going to uh, be able to receive uh, over its lifetime, which may be 30 years. A first order importance is what the carbon price is. So everybody that's investing in Texas or anywhere else is thinking about what the carbon price is in those future years. And what sort of information are we giving people uh, about that carbon price? Well, our politicians are giving them very poor information. And in fact, I still think that uh, the best hope uh, and the best path forward is to uh, negotiate, perhaps among just a few countries, a, um, a significant carbon price price path going forward. And that, in fact, is the most viable plan in the United States, which is uh, the carbon dividend plan, which is pending legislation in the House with, uh, I, th I think, 45 uh, congressional supporters in both parties. And um, this is uh, very simple. We have a carbon price that starts out fairly low, goes up rather quickly um, each year until our goal is met. Revenues are rebated back to, on a per capita basis. This is very nice. This makes about 70% of the population better off financially uh, with the carbon dividend than without it. And at the same time, we can replace many inefficient regulations, lots of uh, inefficient subsidies, that, uh, like our subsidies for coal and, and all, all sorts of things, and, and uh, various command and control provisions that uh, are very inefficient. And finally, and this is actually the very important element, is a carbon border adjustment. Uh, 
and I say for reciprocity. And uh, essentially, the, you know, the biggest reaction against carbon pricing is first, people using the evil word tax. Um, but second is that there's a, a big view as Trump has articulated, you know, why should we uh, do something when China's not? So it's, you know, it's all about reciprocity is hugely important. And um, this is something that, and, and so the carbon border adjustment ad, uh, addresses that. It basically says, well, um, you've got goods coming into the United States and if you're not going to collect the carbon uh, revenues, we will. And that's a very strong motivator for them to collect the carbon revenues. Um, and so I think that that will uh, provide a good basis for negotiation, um, but we will see. The challenges are, are great. Um, uh, for me, this would be a, you know, it's something that's very much actively talked about uh, in the United States. Certainly, the support among economists is universal. Uh, there's literally thousands of economists, including every uh, you know, Nobel Prize, uh, Chairman of Council of Economic Advisor, Treasury Secretary, everything, uh, supports it. Uh, in the United States, the um, uh, population does as well, uh, four to one. Um, two to one among Republicans. Four to one among Republicans under 40, uh, which is good. Uh, and seven to one, or actually it's 16 to one among um, Democrats. So, you know, there's, there is quite a, quite a bit of support. Something like this would help out investors in, in the electricity sector enormously. Now, another idea that I have is that the electricity sector, and this has been uh, exploited before, that the electricity sector is actually relatively easy to do. Um, in terms of effective uh, carbon pol climate policy because uh, it's so well controlled and measured, something that uh, Jean has emphasized, the, the difficulties in measuring when using a carbon price approach. But in, in this case, measurement is uh, fairly straightforward and um, so to get the ball rolling, it might make sense, you know, at least to negotiate with respect to uh, the electricity sector. And then, as we've seen in other market design applications, that good idea, it's seen how powerful and effective it is, uh, it leads to a snowball effect and expands into other sectors. But of course, the first best would be to apply it to, to all, all sectors, or nearly all sectors. So with that, let me, uh, conclude uh, early so that we'll have time for questions. Um, I think that electricity market design is a very good example of market design. It's, uh, uh, we've had a lot of development. It's a market where you have to get it right or the lights go out. So uh, you have to get it right eventually or, or either the lights go out or it's really expensive. And we're actually seeing a bit of both taking place. Um, but the best, spot, the best uh, markets are running uh, very well, especially the spot markets. Uh, highly, highly efficient. We, we do have lots of forward contracting, which is wonderful. And we have um, uh, competitive retail markets, uh, which have been difficult as well, but are getting better and um, uh, better and will enable extensive demand response in time, uh, but it's very difficult to get these uh, smart home technologies uh, into the homes. Uh, one thing that's going to be very important is good governance to make sure that the market rules do evolve in a way that is helpful. Lots of markets, like financial markets, you don't necessarily see markets evolving in ways uh, that improve efficiency. The market uh, is often captured, or the regulators captured by um, the uh, intermediaries that are making money from the inefficiencies of the status quo, and that tends to uh, perpetuate. Um, we've done better in electricity, I think. We've had really uh, big advances, and we've certainly had a lot of problems, a lot of mistakes, but 
uh, we're getting better and better at it, and uh, good governance um, is incredibly helpful in making sure you move towards a better path rather than a worse path. And this now is, you know, more, more hope. This is actually is a, a solar plus battery uh, in Florida uh, that's uh, being expanded to uh, uh, 490 megawatts of battery storage in the future. That first picture that I started with um, is South Australia, which was the largest battery in the world in way back in uh, December of 2017. But uh, now, as you can see, uh, the batteries are getting much bigger and uh, will be a very nice way to support lots of renewables uh, as long as they are receiving the right price incentives in the spot market um, so that they can anticipate uh, profitable returns uh, in their long life. So with that, I will stop. Thank you.